very much for being here. It's our pleasure. It's our honor to have you gentlemen here. Um, this, this is, this is a, a very rare occurrence, and, and we're very grateful for your presence here. And once again, thank you for your service. So before we get started, let's give these guys a round of applause. Huh? Starting off with Mr. Patterson here to my left. Yes, sir. Uh, if you guys could, uh, what, do you, what do you recall of Camp Shelby during the war? What, what do you remember from Camp Shelby during the war? Uh, 1940, 19, September of 43 to about December of 45, approximately. About a year, almost a year and a half in Camp Shelby. And, uh, and we went overseas, of course, to, to uh, Connecticut, I mean, New Jersey, Camp Lucky Strike, I think. No, that was in Europe, excuse me. Anyway, it was a POE near New York, New Jersey. We were there about a week or so and got shots and had an artificial ship there. We could climb to pretend like we were going to jump ship or in case we had an accident or something. Then we were about 10 days on the ocean, pretty rough weather, about 15 foot waves, I remember. And we were seasick most of the way. And I lived on some kind of carpet that had fig newtons and grapes and grazing them. I bought them out in the PX, I know that. That's all I lived on, I guess. Well, because my bunk was on the second tier and the mess hall was below, like when we had to stand on long stairs like this to go down to the mess hall. Well, they were all lined up, so you stop the town, start at the top of the stairs, and it would have to be a line like the GI. By the time we got to the mess hall, you were sick. So I never did make it down to the mess hall anyway. <laughs> so I came back to my room and lived on these crackers for almost 10 days. And we landed in La Havre, of course, about that night, one night. And uh, from then on, it wasn't too bad. It was cold as heck, but we had a pretty long truck ride to Camp Monkey Strike, and the driver of the truck was full of baloney, and he, a lot, like, he said, uh, oh, you've got a beautiful camp we're going to take you to, just relax. So we were all stacked in the back of this open truck, about 50 guys, and shivering, and we got there, and the one thing there except tents flapping in the breeze, there wasn't any mess hall or anything. We had a stove about big, like that, about that high, end of each barrack with these wooden barracks. Excuse me, the end of each wooden barracks. And we tried to keep warm from those two stoves that had coal, like briquettes inside to keep you warm. The only bad part about this was like, we tossed coins on things I lost because I got the end bunk and it was right near the flaps. The wind would come through and <laughs> I freeze to death at night. So I stayed there. I did get frostbite, I know that, but I didn't, Get uh, serious just enough to get my leg cut off. I thought I was. My legs were swollen up for about a month, I guess. I couldn't wear my shoes. I wore galoshes for a long while. And it finally it went thawed up. The weather got better. And we did move up at that time into France and Germany. We'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a minute if you could pass the mic on down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm good. Ain't nothing wrong with that, you know. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, the most I remember about uh, the camp is, uh, well, coming from Ohio, it was cold and it was snowing and everything, and down here it was so hot and put in too many chiggers, too many snakes. <laughs> and uh, when they take us on maneuvers back in the too much swamp and everything, and uh, otherwise I didn't like it. <laughs> but what choice did I have? Yeah. Oh, just so you know, it, it hadn't changed. It's still hot. <laughs> Lots of snakes and oh, yeah, mosquitoes. Yeah. Yeah. I could tell you some snake deal, but I mean, the thing is, uh, at the time, I wondered why would somebody live down here? <laughs> because, I mean, it's, we're so used to Ohio that to us, it's better weather and everything. And, uh, so, uh, Anyways, uh, then they, we left there and like 
my buddy there said it looked uh, like he strikes. Not like he strikes at all. <laughs> all that was a freezing cold stuff, and uh, it was so cold during the day, it was a little within tents. I think about 16 years old tent. And it was so cold, we were scrying around all over and trying to find something to put in, not to, to, to burn it, so we could do the stove do. A couple of guys got so cold they burnt their butts off their guns and burnt the wood slugs off their guns to, to warm up with that cold. Oh, wow. And uh, very, very little food. And then uh, they put us on ships to go overseas and we had no idea where we were going. They didn't tell us. We didn't even see the Statue of Liberty going out because we had to go below deck. And uh, when you got to the English Channel, uh, submarine uh, shut the uh, propeller off of one of our ships and we had to, uh, they, they towed the one ship in and we, we got to, well then that's where we got to the or our Antarctic uh, strike, but uh, it, uh, it was different, <laughs> and I wouldn't want to do it again. But <laughs> yeah. Suffice it to say, it, it was it, it, not, not pleasant. <laughs> it, it, suffice it to say, it was not a pleasant experience. It wasn't very pleasant, no. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, of course, it was quite an experience for, I think, I was 18, 19 years old at the time. And, there you are. And uh, at that time, we were 18, 19 years old, a little bit cocky and knew everything, but she thought she did anyways. I found out I didn't. But uh, it was a fun trip, really. You can pass it on down the line. Well, what's your story? <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Lewis, uh, what do you recall from Camp Shelby during, uh, during your time here during the war? Uh, just Shelby? Well, I, I was one of those guys who was in aviation cadets, and there was a bunch of them dumped in the Shelby. What happened, uh, the cadet program, if you didn't have college, you attended a college training detachment, detachment for six months. Well, I attended Tampa University for four months, and all of a sudden, boom, it was all shut down all over the whole country and everybody was dumped in the infantry. That's how I wound up in Camp Shelby. I left Tampa the third week in April 1944 and wound up in Camp Shelby until the end of 44. We got on trains and headed for Camp Shanks. I remember Christmas Day, we're sailing past McGee Street. I could look up the street to where my girlfriend lived. We got married <laughs> after the war. <laughs> But uh, anyhow, we arrived in, in Shanks, shipped out on January 10th, arrived January 22nd, very slow with all the, these people don't realize, I don't know how many troop ships, I would say 300, it's probably too many, but we were surrounded, and not troop ships, I mean cargo ships, we were surrounded by cargo ships. We had five troop ships and they were side by side. And only one time it happened on the way over, we got this alarm. And I don't know how the slow moving ships did it so quickly, but the five ships lined up one behind the other, and all the cargo ships were on one side of us. And we on the horizon on that, on that side, they were dropping depth charges. We had destroyers escorting us over, but they were always way out on the horizon. You just about see them. But anyhow, we arrived in France, and the uh, ship pulled, and we were originally supposed to go to England, but because of what was going on in the English Channel, they thought maybe, you know, there we would have some problems with German submarines. So we went to France, and uh, we landed in the salt boats. We climbed down on the ship in the salt boat. They dropped the gate. We went up on the ground, which was covered with snow. And the troop ship, uh, the uh, bus, buses, bus, come on, bus. <laughs> the trucks picked us up and took us to Camp Shelby. And I'll tell, 
and I felt lucky strike. Oh, I'm really, but uh, you know where I am. <laughs> Anyhow, I took his lucky strike, and there were about two feet of snow on the ground, and there's these big pile of bundles about three feet square, and they said, there's your tents. Oh, put them up. We had to clear two feet of snow down to the ground, put up the tents, and that was our billets until we got them up. Within a day or so, we got uh, canvas cots, and then eventually we got straw to put on the ground. But the ground was frozen, even though it was covered with snow, it was frozen hard. So we covered it with straw, and uh, we first got there, there was a division mess. Everybody, one whole division, 15,000 men stood in line to get fed breakfast. After you got your breakfast, you go to the end of the line and wait for dinner, for two meals a day. <laughs> two meals a day, that was it. Well then, they uh, finally broke it down. We had built our tents on, on the snow. We eventually got some straw to put on the floor and we had canvas cots. And cold, you don't know what cold is, even new people live in the north. Uh, we got, and we had, we had two blankets. And eventually they gave us a sleeping bag without the bag, just the, just the liner. The, it was like a uh, blanket with a zipper in it, is what it amounted to. But what we did, we put one layer of blanket on the cot. Then we put the sleeping bag type thing, and we spread our clothes all over that. We spread the, uh, the, the half a tent, every, every pack, every man's pack had half of a pup tent in it, because you're supposed to get to the, another man, put the two together to make one pup tent. Anyhow, we spread that half a pup tent, all our clothes, sleeping bag, uh, the, the flip the blanket over, bring the uh, half a pup tent over, and with all more clothes on top, then we'd lace it up with a tent rope. We used to climb into that at night, then take the hole for your face, swing it around, and lay on it. So you, so you had nothing in front of you but the blanket. In the morning, you'd wake up with about a five-inch circle of frozen breath. It was cold. <laughs> but that was lucky strike. And then, of course, I'd throw it out, and it became a sea of mud. A sea of mud, you know, we didn't have galoshes. They finally issued about three pairs of galoshes for a whole squad of 12 men. And one size. Some guys' feet couldn't fit into them. So they take their shoes off and put their socket feet in the galoshes and go get their chow and bring it back to the tent. Get the galoshes to the next man, chow, back to the tent. Well, every so often, those, once the thaw came, all that, the area we were in was a farm. That whole thing turned to a sea of mud and it sink about eight inches to a foot deep into the mud. Well, those galoshes, when you stepped into that mud, it was like a <laughs> suction. <laughs> Some of the guys stepped right into the mud. But anyhow, that's before we got to combat. <laughs> Eventually, we got to safe power. We boarded the trains, took us down to the uh, center of, of France, and we made our way to Sarlover. And we had a couple towns before we hit Sarlover. I, mean, I can't name all the different towns. I can think of a few. The one town the train went through, we stopped in that same town on the way home. But the thing is, we, we didn't go right to Sarlover. We stopped and we were built in the town for a few days. And somebody in that town was a German sympathizer. Of course, we're there, they're all from the Americans. That's what it seemed. But these people, you ran on the border. And you don't know who's German, who's French. Well, that was Fall Car Garden. How many guys remember Fall Car Garden? But they were leaving. I read after the war what it was. The smell of mountain soap in the dish in the pots and pans when they clean it, when they cook the food, that small amount of soap was enough to get dysentery. And 
When we got there at night, we couldn't see anything. When it got daylight the next morning, we had to clean up the mess. Mm. But by the time we left, we were all the same way. Mm. That that food was given every every man dysentery before we lived that down. And we went on K's and C's and all that stuff. We were much better off than fresh food because the K's and C's didn't have any of those contaminants in them. I don't know where you want me to go. We're, 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 we're going to pass it on down to Mr. McClure. He's our late arrival. Mr. McClure, what do, you, what do you remember at Camp Shelby? Well, I, I, I know my memories kind of go on. I remember Camp Shelby. I was an aviation student just like uh, Ed Lewis. And uh, I was at Mississippi State. And uh, we had five months there. And then we thought we were going to pre flight. They lined us all up. We thought we were going to Texas to pre flight. And uh, it, it didn't happen. They sent us to Shelby. And uh, I was in the engineers before. I was in the Air Force, so um, they put me in the engineers. So um, I had to take training all over again. And uh, that's about all. I, Ed described the Camp Lucky Strike very well. So, um, well, if, if you guys get overseas and you know, we've heard about Camp Lucky Strike and how, you know, as one of you gentlemen said, it was, there was nothing lucky about it. But uh, you, you make your way across France and you get into Germany and you guys start start getting into combat. What, what are some of the first instances of combat that you remember? What, what are some of the things that stick out well, in your mind? Well, we were in Sarlotte and that was later Saint Louis. And, uh, all I can describe it as is hell. What, are, what is, is there anything specific that stands out in your mind? Any, any specific memory? What was that question? <laughs> are there any specific memories of combat that stand out in your mind? Anything comes back to you? It, it, it was terrible. Yeah, that's all I can describe it as is hell. Hmm. Mr. Lewis, if, if Mr. Lewis, what about you? You, 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 you kind of stopped there when you guys were getting to the Sarlo. Where you want me to go? Yeah, we went into combat Sarlo. Uh, we arrived late at night. Of course, you always you do all your mo movements at night during the war. And we relieved the 26th Division. And uh, we were right on the Sar River. But our platoon was back at Third Army Headquarters, which was about maybe 500 yards from the river. And we put one man, and I was one of the men, on each outpost to relieve the two men from the 26th Division so they could pull out. And I was there all by myself, first night in combat. I'll tell you something that people don't realize. Nothing goes on during the day. <laughs> Nothing. Quiet, <laughs> nice countryside. As soon as it gets dark, all hell breaks loose. And on our side of the river, we had a spotlight aiming up in the sky, and it gave us enough light that you could see combat patrols or anything like that. And I'll tell you what was laying on the ground in a lot of spots you'd see in the daytime, dead dogs, cats, and even moved. You had a piss that you had a sign and a countersign. You'd holler halt. They'd say the you'd say the sign. They'd set to say the right counter sign. And if they didn't know the right counter sign, it's the enemy. And that changed every day, every day. So everybody in the American Army would know. I don't know how they did it. The same counter sign. So if uh, you see some movement, you say halt and say Mickey. That guy better say mouse. <laughs> <laughs> 
but they had a sign and countersign, but there was dead animals because they didn't answer the countersign. <laughs> <laughs> they were. That's how that's, that's yeah. you laugh. That's, that's a fact. Because right. you didn't know what, what was coming at you. And uh, the Germans sent patrols on our side to find out where we were, what we were doing. We sent patrols to the German side. So that's part of the story. We had a combat patrol. I didn't go. They just asked for volunteers. There were 12 men went. And we had received, when we were uh, in Sarlor, and we received two replacements, because we were short of men. The whole 65th was short of men. I don't know, well, there's not too many guys here, but they'll probably tell you. Every outfit was short of men because before we went overseas, all our men were being shipped from Shelby up to New York as replacements. We lost a lot of men while we were in Shelby as replacements. So we needed two men. So we got two men as replacements. And one man was a buck sergeant from the Air Corps. The other guy was a PFC. PFC was Benji, the buck sergeant was Allison. Well, they're going on a combat patrol because they thought an aerial photograph showed the German pillbox. So they got pole charge. Pole charge is a long, uh, a long bamboo pole, and on the end of that, they put sticks of dynamite. When you come on a pillbox, you shove those things into the slot and trigger the dynamite for the pillbox or anybody inside. So they had an aerial reconnaissance that showed a pillbox on the German side of the river, and they asked for volunteers. These fellows went, two of them were replacements. But when they got there, all they could find was trees, no pillbox. It was a bad aerial photograph, so they had to come back. And on the way back to the Sarb River, they had crossed the Sarb River with rubber assault boats. This is a combat patrol, no steel helmets, no entrenching tools, nothing that would make a noise, because you want to you know, sneak up on the enemy. Well, they came back, and on the way back, they were ambushed. The Germans had seen them and set up a machine gun, and they started shooting. Well, as soon as they started shooting machine gun, everybody hit the ground. And this one guy, Benji, said, I'm not going to die on this side of the river. He jumped in the river. Well, the other fellow heard him, so he also jumped in the river. Well, as soon as they hit the water, it's quiet. Boom, they, the, the Germans sprayed with water and machine gun fire, killed both of them. The rest of the men on that patrol just hit the ground, stayed flat on the ground. Sergeant Corvo, who was my assistant squad leader, pulled the pin on the grenade. Four seconds you had. He pulled that pin, he counted one, two, threw it at the machine gun. Boom, the thing exploded, stopped the machine gun. We made our way, they made their way back to the river, and the salt boats, which were rubber, had all been slashed, they were all deflated. But they had to swim back. Oh two guys couldn't swim. So Lieutenant Zupan stayed on the German side of the river for those two, and they dug in on the banks of the river for, for shelter. They stayed there all day long until darkness. Well, after it got dark, Lieutenant Zupan went back up to where the machine gun was. You'll love this story. <laughs> they, he picked up a helmet, and he brought this helmet back. And he wanted, he presented to Ca Captain Gould that night, or Ca Captain Duncan that night sent a, 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 a regular wooden salt boat over and picked the three men that under darkness. And he handed this helmet to Captain Duncan, our company commander, said, here's a souvenir for you. That grenade must have hit the man in the face, part of his head, in that helmet. If you can imagine that, imagine that. But that's how they were able to make it back, because that grenade. And none of our men, none, none were even wounded. The two guys that panicked, who were not regular 65th men, they were replacements. If they had trained with us, that might not have happened. But because, because they didn't train with us, they panicked, and they both died. 
But uh, anyhow, that was Star Wars. I don't know how far you want to go. <laughs> well, Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Newell, if you can back on down, what, what do you remember of, of combat in Europe? Uh, Star Wars. Sarlon. Well, any, any combat that you can recall from, from, from your time overseas? Well, the main thing I can think is uh, I don't feel thankful I'm so small. Because <laughs> 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 of a, a small target. And in many, many times I can hear these bullets go by my head. This is like a bee that close, you know, and uh, they miss me. And yet I, once in a while I hear something that. Big tall guy next to me going down. And so I think that's one of the reasons I survived. Uh, but uh, being in the infantry, uh, we had to, every night we had to dig a false hole, and that's where we, every night that's where we stayed because the 88 was the most awesome thing you ever saw. Uh, they could uh, shoot an airplane down, they could shoot a tank, I mean, and they shot many, many of us. But uh, I know the one time uh, it got so cold, my buddy and I, we dug a foxhole, and uh, we were freezing, actually freezing to death. And uh, so we covered it up with a bunch of pine needles to, to keep warm. When it snowed so hard, we got about two foot of snow on top of the pine needles, and that was the warmest we'd been right along. So we both fell asleep the first time. And we, when we woke up the next day, 200 men, our whole company was gone. And I used to tease my buddy about being a great white hunter because he talked about how he hunted deer, tracked them, and everything. I said, okay, great white hunter. You got 200 guys to find this go. <laughs> and 200 feet, of, or two feet of snow on the ground over their tracks, the tracks are all gone. So uh, we said, well, we'll find them. So we finally got into this one small town and there was a house right on the corner of the street. And I said, let's get in there and we'll get warmed up. So we got in there, there's no roof but a place to go in the house. So we found a bunch of carpet and drifts and stuff that we thrown under there to keep warm. When we got warm, we fell asleep. We woke up and we could hear Germans talking. And uh, I said, that's my buddy, what's that? He said, Germans. And so we got a peek out and the whole room is full of German soldiers. Uh, and Harry could speak German. And, so, and he understood German, so he uh, said, Let's just be quiet. I said, maybe you just throw a hand grenade out and we'll down and get them. No, 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 no. <laughs> so anyways, uh, we lay down until Harry said, well, they're getting ready to leave. And so they pulled out, we, we got up, we looked out the window and uh, they, uh, they left. I think it took us probably three or four days before we finally found our, our found another company. I think it was, I was in B company. We found C Company and they directed us to B Company, so we got the, and the guy said, where are you guys been? <laughs> we said, we got lost. <laughs> and, uh, but anyhow, uh, they welcomed us back to the company and uh, we uh, went off from there and uh, continued the war. We both, both of us survived. Uh, well, the one time, Harry and I, had been, while we were uh, trying to find a company, we were in this one room, and uh, we could hear German, or, no, but, but anyhow, the Germans were coming out of the week, we both had these small, like, small machine guns, we called them breach guns, and, and uh, these Germans were coming at us, and we're mowing them down right at one right at the other. And the next thing we know, a German had snuck up along the wall and just threw a grenade in the room with us. And uh, it, it, with a big potato bag, you could hear that thing roll. That, that was the star line. No. But we could hear this grenade rolling along. And uh, 
So I go down the steps and get bowed down the steps and now hair was hair was wounded. And uh, so we survived. Mm. But uh right and sore. <laughs> Mr. Patterson. Right now. This Mr. Yes, Mr. Patterson, what do you uh, what do you recall from combat overseas? Want to remember? Yes, sir. It's about combat. Well, of course, but being a medic, I didn't have too much shooting naturally. But we did. We were supposed to carry a gun. I did have one in my barracks bag, but I went, brought it back home. I didn't fire. So. Anyway, I guess one of the things that stands up in my mind in terms of combat was we had a uh, counterattack a little town called Struth in Germany and things have gone pretty good except they called us at about four o'clock in the morning we've been sleeping in this German village in a little feather bed I said this sure is nice nice place to stay all of a sudden they called us out of course we have a counterattack so we, the guys I was a medic of course I still we were on top of a hill where I was in this building, house, and the guys down in the village in the town were being attacked. And they, the Germans, what they did, they had hit some tanks inside of these garages in this village, and we were stationed in houses around the area. All of a sudden, they pulled these tanks out at our four o'clock, started shooting her, shooting it up. So, like I said, we were about maybe two or three hundred yards on top of this hill overlooking that. We were kind of a rear guard, I guess. So anyway, what they did, they <clears throat> called in the P-47s and they attacked the tank pretty well, and I understand. And as a result of that, was the dirty deed, of course, pulling up the building. We called in the P-47s and they eventually set fire to the town which was not very nice, but we did. And I was sitting on top of top this hill all the time and observing, you know, what a big deal, you know. Here I am sitting here watching all this. And I was sitting there about from here to the halfway down this room, and I heard a plop. Well, what's that? I was reading a magazine, actually. <laughs> reading the digest, it said, how to increase your word power. I that. So I said, this is pretty nice. So I said, I heard a plop. I looked over there and walked over and said, a German had hit his shell and land and didn't go off. If it had gone off, I wouldn't we'll be talking to you. Yeah. And that was not too bad, but the only other time I can remember distinctly, I didn't keep a record personally or diary or anything, but my, attack, my attendant in charge of our uh, anti-tank platoon had been hit by some bullets and he was in riding in a jeep and it turned over and he broke his arm or his leg, I broke one, I think it was his arm. I gave him a couple of shots of morphine and sent him back to the aid station farther back. And I didn't say more him, of course. And I did get a couple of bronze stars, I guess, or things like that, which I didn't think I deserved. And, uh, well, anyway, we had a few other skirmishes, I guess, but being a medic, we weren't shooting, of course, and we weren't supposed to hurt anybody. But I felt kind of vulnerable because we were running around these German villages, and the streets were real narrow, and the buildings were closed in on top, about two or three stories high. And I was sitting in the back of this truck half the time with the Red Cross on my big helmet, like a flare, you know, that my gosh, they could take a shot to me, I'd be a good target. Thank God I did it, they didn't. I'm still here. And we had a few things like that. Let up. German officer. The what? The German officer. Oh, we in the, well, we. And you were staying in that house? We were staying during the lull there. We were staying in this little German house. It was a nice farmhouse in the country. And I had a picture of myself standing in front of my. I was an aid man to an anti tank outfit. And I was, so they took a picture of me standing in front of this house with a size of the gun and my uniform and everything. So I was pretty nice, that's pretty nice. So about dawn the next morning, we started to pull out and the German colonel came down from upstairs, had been hiding up there in the attic. And we, of course we got him and thank goodness nobody was hurt. And I was kind of impressed by that. 
I guess he was up there all night, but we were sleeping. We didn't think anything was going along. You know, he could, he could have raised heck. Being a typical German, they didn't. Well, anyway, we had several things like that. We lived off the farms. We, got, we picked up eggs here and there in the farmhouse and cooked them in our helmets and stuff like that. It was very sterile, of course. <laughs> and, uh, I was a medic. I was very fastidious, supposedly. And we got potatoes from some people's basement and stole potatoes. And uh, the Germans were very nice to us, in a way, because we told them we were in Patton's army. They didn't give us any flack all the time, but they were very respectful of Jeff Patton's army. And I can't think of anything else very sick. I know a lot of the guys, like I said, had seen more probably casualties than I did, but I'm not, well, I didn't. Anyway, it was, that's about just like the right now. Well, one of the things, uh, and we're going to start wrapping up fairly soon, but, but one of the things that you guys saw, all of y'all, as you were going yeah. all the way through Europe, uh, you guys liberated a couple of concentration camps. Oh, yeah. Well, what, we helped. Uh, well, well, let me ask you, what, what, did, we, what, what did you see? What, what, what were some of the things that you saw? And, and what did that, well, yeah, that we, stick with you? We, stopped, we helped liberate larger camp, concentration camps. And we stopped there, and there were still guys still in there, the prisoners. And then we went in there, and some of our guys went inside. I stayed in my truck. I was riding in the back of the truck, my eight man. And we threw some tender moderations over the fence. And we could see these guys uh, by their big vats of soup about this long. It looked like a wash tub, you know, and they were showing us that stuff, and it looked like green junk. And then we, we saw some American prisoners there, all brands, and, and somebody, about that time I was standing there, somebody threw a, a excuse me, a box of 10 of one rifles past my head and just took me on the ear. Well, I was kind of scared of that, of course. But anyhow, yeah, it was good, it wasn't hurt, thank God. And then this camp there, Ardrup, like I said, next day I understand that General Patton and Eisenhower came down there and checked that camp out because it was only about a mile and a half from the village. But we talked to some of the village there before they got there and said, well, we didn't know the camp was there. Well, they could smell the camp, you know. They have been crazy, so we didn't know any two of them, but then Eisenhower, and they made the people come to the village to help bury the people. Mm -hmm. and, and I understand, too, that Patton threw up because of that. He couldn't stand it. That's true. That's 100 percent true. And I don't know if y'all know or not, but the, the camp that they liberated over was the very first concentration camp ever liberated by American forces. Mm. So these guys were the first Americans to ever witness anything from the Holocaust. Right. Both they were. Yeah. What, what about you, sir? What do you recall from? from uh, the camp yeah, Ordorf was there? the first uh, camp that we liberated. Enemy. Bed. In the bed. It's okay. Well, it is every place. Yeah. Mordhausen was a camp that I'm familiar with. Mordhausen was on the north side of the Danube River, opposite Linz, Austria, which is where we ended the war. But uh, we had taken over ground on the north side, a little town called Urfar. Urfar was the town right across the bridge, and just below that was the Mauthausen concentration camp. We hit that camp. The Germans had abandoned everything. You know, they, when we came, they disappeared. There's no guards or nothing. But I'll tell you one thing. I mean, you've seen pictures. There's people say it never happened, but there was piles of bodies. And Sergeant Cordell, who was my assistant spot leader, he was assigned the job <clears throat> to dig a big long ditch, he and some other men. And dug a big long ditch to put all these bodies in and bury them. But the bodies were stacked 
that's how fast the Germans were killing people. They'd starved to death. They were nothing but skin and bones, like a like a walking skeleton. I mean, you just, I don't know. I'm with him. future generations and some of these soldiers that are standing in this room right now, what would you want them to know? What would you tell them? Boy, that's hard to say. I don't know what I, what I could tell them. It's a different war today. Everything's entirely different. The uh, <clears throat> equipment and everything so far advanced from anything we ever had. I look at the, the tanks we looked at today. The German Tiger tank was the biggest, most powerful tank of World War II. It's being dwarfed. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, what you've got out here is, is bigger than a German tank. That was one of the stories I'm going to tell them. One of them came out of the woods at uh, the, the one town we hit. We had worked our way all the way through town. There was a building at the end of the town. The Germans were in that building. We're in this side of the building. We dove into uh, bomb craters where the town had been bombed for protection. We were below ground. But a German Tiger Royal, biggest tank the Germans had, came out of the woods about maybe 200 yards beyond this building where the Germans were. This tank came down to attack us to aid the Germans in that building. And somebody on our side fired a 4.2 mortar. You know what 4.2 is? Yeah, this 4.2 is about that big. They fired a 4.2 mortar and landed right on the deck of that tank. And all the tank did was put a reverse and go back into the woods. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it was still running, the 4.2 didn't stop it. So they had some tough stuff. Mr. what about you? If there's one thing that you could tell future generations or some of these soldiers in this room, what would you tell them? Europe ever had. 
and we had to be there for that honor, I guess. But I mean, uh, God, I mean, I, I didn't think I was ever going to get warmed up after I left out of there. I mean, uh, and with my feet and his legs and stuff, still don't work real good because I'm, I've been frozen so many times. And, and actually, uh, we were supposed to get warm, clo warm water clothing and stuff, but never happened. We never got it. The clothing we went over there, and uh, that's what we had the whole time. And uh, the lady had got the uh, Struis. And Struis, what happened, the, uh, there was a uh, gold mine there at Struis. And uh, the Germans had uh, thousands and thousands of dollars, millions of dollars, I guess, worth of paintings and jewelry and stuff that they stole off of the French net, hidden in this mine. And the, uh, uh, I think the seat company might have been a little money here, was stationed in there at the time, or in there at the time, and the German counterattacked to get these guys. And uh, I was in B company, but we were chosen as the company to go in and clean out the truth, get the German out of there to save these other guys. And uh, so, uh, that was quite a fight there. And, uh, and right after that was when we, uh, I think it was just a very, very short time that we left there and we could see all these uh, people walking down, uh, down the street with nothing but ragged, uh, nothing but scattered bone and everything, a lot of dead ones in the ditch. Here, uh, they were people that were, had gotten out of order. And uh, the Germans, uh, they caught them, you know, escaping, they just killed them a little way there. And we saw bodies for miles before we got the order. But then when we got the order, I mean, it was just nothing but skin and bone and bodies. And uh, they had these ovens that they were burning the bodies in. And we saw the black smoke as we approached here. And, uh, Uh, yeah, well, but uh, they, uh, uh, well, what happened then, too, uh, when we exposed the order, uh, they made the German people from the town right there come out and kind of cleaned up the camp and bury the bodies, and the, uh, the mayor and his wife from border, they went home and committed suicide after they saw it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Mr. Patterson, what, what about you, sir? Is, is there anything you Yeah, want? I might say something. I was thought it was rather interesting. <laughs> rather interesting during the war going through Germany. We ran into course, German civilians quite a bit. <coughs> but you know something? There were no Nazis. Every time we talk to him, oh, we need next Nazi. No, we need next Nazi. So, well, yes, sir. Another thing is, I'm not trying to toot my own horn or our armies, but as we, uh, later on when we came home, we got the 6th Division every, bulletin every year. And I said a little article in there one time. I thought it was rather significant to me. I said, I don't think we realized when we were over there that we were part of a great historical thing. We didn't read it to read it thought we were just little cogs in a wheel. But you look back on it, well, we're really important people. I mean, I'm not bragging at all, but I think that's the way I felt about it. And I sent that end article to the division bulletin. and they printed that one month. I'm glad they did anyway. That's about the extent of my talk, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Well, that's a hell of a way to wrap it
compared to what we do with people. Thank you all so very much for being here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.